<laughs> of course. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Lockhart and the Known World. Here is another interview this evening of Between Two Roses with Duquesa Constancia de Zamora, also a dame of Lockhart <laughs> and a baroness and many other things. Our hosts tonight are myself, Becky Altani and Duchess Eva. Thank you. So before we kick things off, I'd like to uh, officially acknowledge the lands on which we are conversing today. So good nobles, we come here today in the spirit of fellowship, deepening of our skills, sharing of our knowledge and a shared interest in the search to find truth for it through experimental archeology span and historical inquiry. It is in that context that I, Duchess Eva, on behalf of my kingdom, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we gather today. We recognize their continuing connection to the land and culture, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and the elders from the communities who may be here watching today. And I personally reside in Adelaide, South Australia, which is Ghana country. Uh, Your Grace Constancia, where are you currently residing? I'm currently residing in uh, Yagara Jagara Turrbal country, which is known as Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, or to us, it's the barony of St. Florian del Riviere. And I am in the barony of Rowany, which is Sydney, Australia, also known for the lands of the Aura, the Aura Karingai, Durag and Faragol peoples with Wiradugi as well. It's quite a large area. Um, my personal lands where my where the lands that I reside on are the lands of the Kadigal, the Wangal and the Benigal people of the Darug tribe. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Duchess Constancia. And uh, I believe Altani has the first question for you tonight. I do. And what could that be? Mm. Your Grace, how many reigns have you done in <laughs> your lifetime, whether it's as baronial? princess or queen? Oh, well, uh, my husband, Gabriel and I were the founding members of uh, St. Florent de la Riviere. Founding members, fa founding baron and baroness, we weren't the founding members. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, we've been uh, crown of Lockhart twice. Fantastic. Thank you. And Sorry about that. <laughs> A little it's rude. <laughs> and so what got you started in the SCA? What attracted you to it? And what did your introduction to the SCA look like? Ooh, okay, radio. So I, uh, before the SCA, I had a fabulous music teacher up in Cairns and um, she got us dressed up in frocks and took us down the mall and we got to sing madrigals. And I thought that was the best thing ever. Um, I eventually moved down to Brizzy, Brisbane and um, I thought this would be a fun thing to try and explore. And uh, I found the SCA through um, a guy that I'd met at work. Um, and it wasn't what I had hoped initially. It was a little bit more filk and pizza. Um, but the group that started to form from that, from after that time period, started looking at more period clothing, period music, and I was able to form a, a, a choir, a madrigal group, and um, did that for a few years, and that was lots of fun. Did you have an interest in history before you came to the Society? Oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, um, I wanted to do middle me medieval history at school, but it wasn't offered. I could either do ancient, but no one else wanted to do ancient, so I got stuck with modern history. <laughs> Um, and that was fine. Modern history is fabulous. It's very interesting, but it wasn't um, it wasn't where I wanted where I was curious, if that makes sense. Hmm. Hmm. And at university, did you follow it on from there? I never went to university. Oh, there you go. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've lost it with my children coming through, and it's just I am. I'm yes. all over the place. I am. Yes. So with your music, mm -hmm. like I, you're mostly a conductor from memory. I was, yes, a long time ago. I haven't um, been involved there. We haven't had a choir up here for some time, but um, I handed the reins over to one of my students 
Right. Um, yeah. So I, think, I vaguely remember you performing at Rowany. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we started that group about 1993, I think, um, and uh, we performed a lot. Um, every feast, every opportunity we could. Um, we did some uh, sacred music down at Romany Festival for Easter, uh, particularly with organising the um, uh, mass. Yeah, that's right. We organised the mass. Um, so, and that was fun. You know, us we would learn half the mass, and um, another choir would learn the other half of the mass, and so we would take turns in doing the the music. So that was we were able to spread the load. So that's lots of fun. Hmm. Do you wish you could get back into the music side of things? It's a lot of work. I was um, teaching music uh, a couple of times a week plus conducting uh, right. just practice weekly. And I, um, as much as I love uh, music and love doing choral performances, I think that it's quite time consuming to get people up to a up to a point, if that makes sense. Yep. So we would be starting again from scratch and building them up. So it's how many hours I have in the day and I don't have many anymore, sadly. I think you lose them as you get older. <laughs> so, Another thing. Sorry, Eva. You go ahead. No. No, you go. <laughs> I was just going to comment that it, so you're, you were laureled for your work in period choral conducting, which, <laughs> Um, based around all of the fantastic garb that you make and all of your research into uh, Spanish culture is is one of those things that I think is like a hidden little uh, trivia gem because <laughs> you, you, you do so many fabulous works of art that, you know, it, it, it isn't something that I think is widely known. So how did you begin your research into period conducting? Because I, for me, for my artistic practice, you know, there's bits and pieces that are are left that are very visual and I couldn't imagine starting on something that is more of a practical practice. Well a lot of the music's written so that's a good start so it's quite easy to start with so um, there's some fabulous um, accounts of um, I'm just we're going back 20 years here, so I just have to think back a little bit. There are some fabulous accounts of various different, um, like maybe the altos were getting fined for something or for doing something. You know, there's all sorts of really interesting little um, accounts in texts that you can find in relation to coal music around, other than just the music itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I guess... Yeah, it's just prack, lots of it. <laughs> lots of prack and lots of, I don't know, team building. It's basically a great big team building exercise. You're constantly trying to reassure people. It's okay to sing slightly flat today. You're going to sing slightly flat. So, you know, that's all right. We'll, we will adjust. Well, I know from my personal experience, the one time that I joined into a, a chorus was I think a coronation. No, it was my own step down, and I joined in. And you were very welcoming. And I can't read sheet music, so you oh. were you were amazing, amazing guidance at that point. <laughs> very good. <laughs> I'm glad. Do you have a favourite piece that you've performed? I think the piece that I found the most difficult that we performed was Factum's um, Factum et Solentium. Um, which is slightly out of period, but it's 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 tricky. Um, it's got a lot of cascading bits. <laughs> and that's the, that's the um, official terms, yes. Yeah, that's right. I mean, like, I've done this for like twenty years. So this is really like oh, like oh, what's your favourite piece of mm. uh, um, And sleep fleshly birth, I think, is probably my other. Um, favorite one to sing and I think the reason why is that it just sits really sweetly in my in my vocal range um, I usually sing second soprano um, and that just I don't know what it is it's just smack straight in my strong very comfortable range it's fabulous hmm. so I'm gonna take us back into the way way back machine uh -huh. and of course you and 
you've reigned twice and been Baroness with the lovely Duke Gabriel. So <laughs> how did you two meet? Did you meet in the society or outside? Uh, 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 we met outside of the SCA um, and uh, he was, I'm looking over toward him in the back room. He <laughs> was, um, we had sorry. mutual friends and he's just yelling from the, from the, just say it. We had a mutual friend um, that was quite fond of me at that time. So poor old Gabs got dragged over as this guy was just dropping in, dropping over flowers and all that sort of nonsense. Um, and I thought it was a bit cute, but I thought he was a bit, an, a bit of an arrogant prat. Um, and um, so, I mean, eventually the uh, situation was that I was single and I was thinking, well, if I was going to, like, I kept on going out with guys that were probably right for me. And I went, well, if I sat down and gave myself a list of attributes that I appreciate, what are the attributes that I appreciate? And the only thing that was the arrogant pratness that, you know, was a bit of a drawback for Gabs. So um, I, we started seeing each other and then I said, look, love me love the SCA, right? You just, this is it. I'm doing this. You can come, you can join me or else I don't think this is going to work. So I made it very clear at the very beginning, which is a bit, you know, cheeky, but, mm. and then he made me promise to um, read a Victorian novel for every event he went to and I never did. So that's my guilty confession. <laughs> He will make you do that at some point in the near future, I imagine. <laughs> I don't know if there's enough Victorian novels. He's done a lot, like, he's been to a lot of events now. Mm. <laughs> so getting back to one of the original questions about, about you reigning as Queen and as Baroness, mm -hmm. what do you see as, which do you prefer and what do you see the differences in those two positions? Um, I like them both for different reasons. And I think what I appreciate about being Baroness, I mean, I find the workload is about the same. I know that some people talk about reigning as king and queen as being a bit of a sprint and being Baron and Baroness as a marathon. And yes, that's correct. But the idea that the workload is like l less intensive for Baron and Baroness, I guess that really depends on the barony that you're in. And it depends on the people that you are. So it doesn't matter what Gabs and I do, we tend to be full on or full off, right? So we either do it, commit to it, or we don't do it. Um, so, and what I liked about being Baroness was that it was about community building and bringing everyone together and getting, you know, getting stuff done and blah, 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 blah. What I liked about being, and, you know, recognizing people locally. And what I liked about being Queen was, again, recognizing people for their great works and when you the difference between being the baron and baroness of a group is that you get to see the barony warts and all right like you get to see all of its foibles you guys know you both have been baron and baroness sorry baronesses and you've both been queens um and princess of course um <laughs> whereas when you're queen you basically get to see the shiny bits when you're visiting groups mm to see them at their best you know behavior whatever that might look like um and they're most enthusiastic well you don't necessarily see that in a barony but when you do get those wonderful um moments they're quite precious absolutely so so um is there one or two really special moments that you'd like to share and talk about from any of your reigns? Hmm. I'd have to come back to you on that. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to do the quick responses on, on things. I have to sit down and reflect and stroke my chin and anyway, and think back wistfully because, you know, we stepped down as crown like 10 years ago was our last reign. So we are, it's back in the back of the memory. Back Absolutely. Back. Oh, that's okay. I've got a, a backup question. But <laughs> Needed to ask, but I think it's one that is that everyone's wondering how is it having Vandal as a student? <laughs> yeah, look, you know, Vandal's all right. He um, has tried unsuccessfully to train me in drinking for many years. Um, you know, uh, the whole 
sort of objective of him getting to wear shoes. That was a bit of a challenge. You know, he does he does it reluctantly when there's court. It might be thongs, but you know. Um, yeah, and no. <laughs> oh, and marshalling. Yeah, getting him to wear shoes while he's marshalling. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, he's a real gentleman. I remember after the last Roses tea, he had uh, your taxi ready to go, which was a wheelbarrow. <laughs> it was a wheelbarrow, and I did get uh, the drunken Duchess drop off. Yes, uh, you did. <laughs> yep, but you know, fair. Really, that's a fair, fair commentary from from Vandal. I must say. <laughs> We have another child interlude. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, so backtracking back to being Baroness of St. Florian de la Riviere, obviously being the inaugural Baroness gives you a lot of, well, you have a lot of direction in forming the traditions of the barony from the very start. So what sort of ideas sort of came through and what was important to you at that time when thinking about forming the inaugural awards and the flavour of the group? Yep. So we did a lot of, con lot of consultation with the uh, members of the barony. We had a long sort of lead in time. So we found out that we were going to be the Baron and Baroness of the group in November and we didn't step up until the end of July. So that's a good eight months sort of lead in time that you've got that you can do consultation in terms of what awards people want and what how the structure would work. So, and we did a lot of that. Um, so I guess what was important was that we recognize everybody's work equally. Um, so that it's not just a marshalette award, that marshalette award could cover service to marshal. It is an open-ended mar marshalette award. It could be for service. It could be for good fighting. It could be, or you know, whatever. It's an open-ended one. Um, the it wasn't just about being the prettiest or making the prettiest thing. It was making the making the barony beautiful in some way. So it's not just a singular thing. It was a little bit more open, um, and that was the type of stuff that we were hoping to. We didn't want to like close things because when we've got more people coming in like new baron and baronesses they want to add things too so we didn't want to like create all of the things you wanted to make sure that we've got the basics done and then allowed scope for development of awards or traditions that's very smart hmm. um do you have a favorite tradition that your barony brings you joy with or that you fondly remember that is yours Oh, that's mine. Oh, no. Oh, either yours or what something, what another B&B has brought into you. Something I real call fondly is um, Master, Master Stefano um, singing Old MacDonald Had a Farm in Latin as our blessing and perhaps spreading 4X across the the grounds. 4X is a beer, just incidentally, in from Queensland, <laughs> just for those people who are not from Australia. Um <laughs> Blessing, you know, making this land Queensland by throwing forex all over it—all those sorts of really stupid <laughs> things that you do. Um, it's lots of fun, though. So, um, yeah. <laughs> sticky, and it's sticky, and the ants come. Yeah. It's not—it's not the smartest thing, but that's okay. That's anyway. Fun, yeah, fun, fun, not smart. <laughs> And have you travelled outside of Lock? I know that you and Gabs have gone to Gulf Wars. Yep. How many other kingdoms have you gone uh, to? Eventually? Yeah, okay. So we've been to Penzik a couple of times and we've been to Gulf War a couple of times. Um, so they're the only two other sort of inter-kingdom SCA events that we've been to. Um, we've also... Um, excuse me, someone uh, said... Radio. Uh, and um, the and we've also been to a reenactment in Spain, so that's not SCA. So that that was kind of different. Mm. Hot. <laughs> How different was it? Like obviously, 
it's Spain, so language and cu culturally it's quite different. But how, how was that compared to SCA? Yeah, well, it was, it was uh, so we usually had activities that you can do and we had activities as a performance to the people who were coming in. So it's all performance work um, and that's fine. It's just that we don't speak any Spanish. So we were used, we, we became people to take photos of, you know, really. And we did a lot of marching. They do a lot of parades, can I just say. <laughs> it's, anyway, so it was fun. Um, I think that if I had language skills and better relationships with those people, I would have a, an amazing time. Um, as it was, we had a great time, but it wasn't like going to Rony Festival and you see your mates here I haven't seen for ages or all those sorts of things. So there's something particularly nice about those long term relationships that you build. Mm. Yeah. Muy bueno, right? <laughs> Muy bueno. Muy bueno. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, there's Knights of the North is probably something that um, is an event that Gabriel started up here. That is something that is probably one of my favorite events in Queensland and one of the favorite traditions that we have up here because it's mainly the, the night standing up and just saying, well, they're not saying inappropriate things. They're just saying very silly things. Um, and it's lots of fun. So I must, I must stream that one day to see so everyone else can enjoy the shenanigans. Absolutely. I have to get up for that one, one year. So I'm going to do the whole red carpet thing. You have to tell us about what you're wearing because your headgear is magnificent. And I know that this is a recent obsession for you. <laughs> so please tell us about it. So this, um, I'm wearing Northern Spanish clothing. Um, and I really love it because of this weird, these weird, headpieces and there's a whole range there's a whole series of them and they get more obscure and weird one looks like a rhinoceros rhinoceros i can't say yes that's right that's what it looks like like it i'm gonna make that i'm gonna make that and so it goes, it's like a one horn two horns horns going like multiple horns going that way and ridges and it's over the top of this dress that has ridges on the outside of the dress as well i need it in my life um it is so weird um yes i need it were but any, were any of these yeah oh. it's lovely are any of these actually allegoric allegorical rather than uh what they actually wore or is it something that they actually did wear well, the earliest version that we have is in the 14th century in Galicia. So a lot of this stuff is referred to as Basque gear, and it's not. It's Northern Spanish. So the first um, we see, so and they're all wandering around the place, and none of this is allegorical at all. There's no Jesus involved. There's no, there's, these are not up on churches or anything. These are in texts. Right. Um, that's not true. That fourth, first 14th century one is actually in the, it's basically the killing of all the, you know, the, the story where all the, the killing of the innocents. Yes. Or the, yeah. Yep. Um, so, but um, there's tapestries, there's, they're wearing this headgear stuff with that really typical late 16th century court where that they kind of look like Daleks, you know, with that great... <laughs> Yeah, that, that's going there too. Um, <laughs> so like there's, and, and that is a ceremonial, like you've got the crown there, there's some sort of, and there's all these peop, women in the background wearing this business over the top of, anyway, it's um, hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. And there's not enough stupid headwear in the SCA is all I can say. Not. It really makes the outfit though, like overall, mm. Hmm. Um, as soon as you put on a henan or a hat or something, it really completes the outfit. But definitely extreme headgear, there needs to be more of, in my opinion. Absolutely. I think sometimes it's also knowing how to make the headgear. <laughs> I, I saw your process as you were making yours and just going, how? Oh, the first one I tried to make with bloody string because I thought like a pottery, you know how you used to make the snake coils yeah i thought i'll give a go i'll give that a go and see if that works and it works but it took me a month to make who's got time for that um 
So the next time uh, Mistress Matilde suggested a sombrero top had the be good beginning of it. And so went New Beauty. We'll give that a crack. So I grabbed a sombrero and I unpicked the brim. And then I um, created this part here and just attached it on, if that makes sense. So the, this is just like one of those ones that you get from like a, a Mexican hat. Mexican hat from, I don't know, Mexican place. They give you free hats when you drink too much or it's your birthday or whatever. Um, and then I've just added that bit on top. Go. I was watching your experiments with the, the Bunnings hat and I'm like, there's nothing more Aussie than that. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. I think that there should be more hats made with Bunnings hats. I think they're very universally, like they're easy. They're five bucks. You can pick them up at, you know, any Bunnings, which is they're everywhere. So they're, they're awesome. <laughs> so how did you choose your name and device? Hmm. Okay. Um, so Constanza was the wife of Armadeus. So I thought that was a good name. And uh, I grew up in North Queensland in Tully. And my mum suggested, hey, why don't you look at Spanish? Spanish is a bit different. It's not, it's not the same. It's got that, you know, and I didn't realise how true that statement was until I started researching a little bit more about Spain. But, um, and there was a family that lived in my small town with the surname of Zamora. And I said, right, Constanza de Zamora. Great, easy name. And then when I registered my name, I stuck a Morales in there because I could. Um, and um, so the device, I guess, I mean, my favorite color is red. Very exciting. And um, it was Sabine who suggested that I grab a Santiago cross and whack it on there because I just thought I'll just whack it white cross and that she'll be right she's no 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 you want a stabby cross so grab that santiago cross and pop it in there and at first i had a chief with three black crescent moons um and then we went to our first crown our uh, second uh, gab's fort in the crown tournament that he won over in darton and they put it on a diamond shape mm, lozenge lozenge it looked bloody terrible. I went, oh, I don't like that. It's rubbish. <laughs> Absolutely rubbish. So and I'm going to change that. And um, so Iberian heraldry is has um, it's quite typical to have a border with lots of stuff in it, right? And it's normally not lots of stuff. It's like eight like repeating items around the outside. Uh, so I thought, right, I'll do that. So that's how I ended up with my current device. That's oh. smart because I know you paint your device and you're you're a huge producer of heraldic goods. So it's important to have a device that looks good on everything, which is really difficult to do because most people want their devices to look like a picture. Well, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And it's got to be user. It's got to work on every different type of shape you put it on. So if it's on a lozenge, if it's in like a like a stand like a standard through to does that make sense? So it, it's. Mm -hmm. Mm. No, I don't think you've actually answered oh, well I haven't been asked um, you've always done Spanish I've never seen you in much else mm -hmm. unless it's as a joke or with friends or something does any other period or style interest you or is it really just the, a whole different world in the Spanish whether it's early or how how early is early for you in Spanish? Well, yeah, I'm really not. You, it's not going to be a very. It's I, you probably won't find me in fourteenth, for example. So fifteenth and sixteenth is usually where I like to hang out. I have dressed in Norse stuff before. I looked like a gnome. Um, <laughs> you know, and your hat is not resembling that, that now. Right. <laughs> well, no, I, I look less like a gnome wearing a hat. <laughs> <laughs> like looks like a gardener. Oh. Uh, yeah, well, that's right. I, I, Gabs now has suggested that perhaps I look more like a Smurf. Um, that's okay. Yep, yeah, that's fine. But um, like, I, when I no, and I think that uh, as much as I love the 
super early stuff. I just want a bit of structure. I don't think my body shape works particularly well without structure. So, yeah. Well, you always look amazing. So yeah. I'm guessing no 14th means you're not going to uh, dress to match the combat of 30 guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I do fabulous Spanish 14th century. Like, uh, isn't it a lot of um, horizontal lines, or is that Italian? No, yeah, there's a lot of horizontal lines in the earlier Spanish stuff. Look, I might be tempted to do 13th century. I might only because I've met some, you know, lovely people in Spain that do 13th century. And (laughs) one day I might go to one of their reenactments, and I want to make sure that I've got the right kit. But yeah, for me, you (laughs) know, you know. So your household, Morales Beaumont, is like an institution in Lockhart and you're quite a large household with a lot of traditions. So how did you first form your household and uh, what is one of your, your favourite things that you do within your household as a group? As a group? <laughs> Ooh, difficult question. Um, so this is one, two, three, my third I want to say my third household? Fourth. Fourth, fourth household. Okay, well, yeah, see, I don't know. I'll collect. Your own fact checker in the background. Fact checker in the background. This is you and Gab's heading the household, though. Yeah, that's right. So this is, the, and um, so, and I've forgotten the question. <laughs> how did you How did you form your household? And what is one of your favourite traditions that you carry as a household? So we formed our household because we stepped down from the household that we were a part of to become um, the Baron and Baroness of the group. It was very important at that time that the Baron and Baroness were not associated with the household. So we opted to step aside from St. Sebastian and they were fabulous, fabulous, fabulous people. And it was a fabulous household to be a part of. Um, But we had students. So we, because we were both... um, I was a peer at that point and Gabs became a peer halfway through us being Baron and Baroness. And then, um, so we just had students and then we stepped down as Baron and Baroness and then Gabs started collecting everybody. Everybody that looked like they needed a home or felt lost or anything like that, he, um, he made sure that they felt that they had somewhere to hang their hat, yeah. which is really sweet. Yeah, it's a lovely tradition to keep that. Yeah. Find the lost souls and <laughs> waves and strays. Well, yeah, it's a bit Hufflepuff though, isn't it? <laughs> Nothing wrong with Hufflepuff. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, Safi commented about peeling garlic isn't good tradition. <laughs> it is now. No, we're going to be purchasing garlic from now. <laughs> there you go, sorry, but you get your one chance. Three to four hours of the bloody peeling. Thanks, mate. So how long has the household been going for since how many years now? I'm waiting for the fact checker to yell it out in the background. <laughs> <laughs> now you want me to- yeah, now I want you to tell me how long it's been going for. Oh, it oh it'd be it's more than that. It, well. Yeah, it would have been as long as oh, about, a couple, about a year or two before we stepped down, so 2003. Um, so a while. 20 years-ish. Almost, 18. So maybe we should have a drink um, for the household <laughs> turning 18. Um, yeah. So I think probably the thing that I like the most about the household is, is that sense of when you're in amongst – oh, the pranks, actually. That's what I like the most about the household is the pranks. There's some very creative people and um, we like to have fun pranking people that we admire. Um, and we always do it with kindness and uh, fun and good spirit, but that's probably my favourite bit. <laughs> I, I know that you do get up to some shenanigans every now and again. <laughs> Maybe. Um, so. Now I'm trying not to ask what kind of shenanigans you get up to, but I won't. <laughs> flag stealing. Yeah, flag stealing. No, I think. Um, it's a bit 90s. Yeah, flag stealing. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I, 
think some of the um, some of my favourite pranks that I've seen is probably abandon all soap you who went to here at the uh, outside of the abyss. Um, when we were over at uh, Golf War, some nameless night, I won't mention any names, of course, brought some little uh, googly eyes and stuck it on the Moose Lodge um, shields um, outside of their, uh, the, the guys that were hosting us at Golf War. And of course, everybody, the and Cole encampment were absolutely convinced it was another kingdom that came along and did that and they thought it was hilarious i'm like i just don't trust australians don't trust australians it wasn't us, it wasn't us. but uh, that was lots of fun they didn't know they didn't find out for 12 months and it was only after i told them <laughs> we did have a um a mole in there that knew just in case someone got offended does that make sense if anything went wrong yeah, it's the australian's fault yeah. it's their fault and then to calm any waters or anything like that. But no, he kept mum the entire time. So I had to tell them a year later. That's a lovely prank, actually. It's a great prank. Googly eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and these moose heads. <laughs> <laughs> like, like a moose in itself is just a weird looking creature. Like, and adding googly eyes to this thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> Lots of fun. So lots of wise idea as well to have somebody that that knows that can diffuse mm. situations. Because I know I've I've been guilty of that before where I go, this prank will be really funny. And then there is somebody that gets a little bit upset about it. So Yeah, smart. that's right. Yeah, that's right. So I guess the the um there's some ground rules around like there's some basic tenets of pranking, and that is be kind, have fun with it. But make sure that you've got a plan B if it backfires, that someone's in there that can, you know, calm the waters or explain, no, 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 it wasn't them, it was these people. And take so you can take responsibility if anybody gets upset. Yep. Yep. And don't damage anything. <laughs> so considering your number of years that you've been in the SCA, what have you seen change from as a newcomer to where you are now, which is quite a respected member of the society <laughs> um hmm i might have to come back to you on that one as That's well fine. on that one um what a, oh, it'll pop into my head yeah. later. well what would you like to see come into the society how would you like to see things change like we are going through a, quite a period of change at the moment um with more recognition towards Indigenous people, um, the LGBTI communities and things like that, and how to incorporate them into... Oh, yes, they've always been there, it's true. Yeah, no, I was about to say, I just want everyone to feel safe. Right. Right? I just want everyone to feel safe and to be able to have fun and feel welcomed and all those sorts of things. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, so, yeah, that's that's... And I think that um, the growth and the growth, the depth, the broth, the breadth and the depth has changed a lot. We're no longer just a European focused reenactment group. It's worldwide. And at that becoming acceptable, like that we're looking at Asian history, we're looking at African history, we're looking at all sorts of different cultures um, is a wonderful thing um i really i never really quite understood um the whole pursuit of your family history through persona play does that make sense i i never really got it because i'm not doing it right so i'm my my fa my ancestry is pretty much uk english um pretty boring a little bit of german on my dad's side but mostly English <laughs> and um, so and I didn't want to do English because it's like blamange so I never really quite understood those people who went oh I'm doing Cel you know Celtic because you know my family's Irish or whatever the case may be I, ne I never yeah. that. Um, until I stood in the you know the church where one of my ancestors was sort of um, baptized or whatever the case may, may be and then you went oh hang on a minute there's a connection here and then being able to see the opportunities for example for the guys over in um, those people who were from um, First Nations people over in the US so um, various different American tribes uh, Indian tribes right rather um, being able to do 
to uh, sort of make connection and discover their ancestors through this process and explore their ancestry through this process. I think it's really, really valuable and lots of very fun, probably very powerful for them as well. And so I'm really glad to see that that is, you know, available and it should really be supported. Absolutely. It's, uh, I'm just going to plug this here now as well, that uh, last year during COVID, obviously, there were a lot of uh, different programs coming out that were really valuable to see uh, more perspectives from a lot of different and, and a variety of members of the SCA. And one thing that I found really interesting as a discussion was Ask the Nights Live did a special edition uh, where they had, uh, of course, uh, Baron Logan Path Warden and Count Sito and uh, Lord Stelios, who are three black men who are avid members of the SCA, and they were discussing issues of the time, which is very early on during COVID, during the BLM movement. Mm. And they did have questions that were based around non European personas and about the difference between appropriation and appreciation. So if anybody is interested in listening to some different perspectives about that, uh, in an SEA context, I suggest having a listen of that. But um, it's definitely, I think it's great that people are, are able to sort of delve into the different cultures that they're interested in, in a fun and, and expressive way. Because as we, what I like about the SEA is that we have this broad spectrum of you can be as serious you, as you like or as silly as you like as long as you make an attempt. So, you know, we have that broad spectrum of players and possibilities, which is really nice. Absolutely. And I think the, the key about that is about respecting the culture that you're researching. or an mm -hmm. act. Absolutely. Yeah. So during your reigns as queen, I think... I think I was actually at both of your coronations. Oh, were you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And one of the things that struck me, especially in your second reign, is that you and Gabs had chosen a variety of household members, uh, or sorry, guards, men and women, mm -hmm. um, based not only on prowess on the field, but also service and arts. And I think that was the first reign that I saw that, particularly a guard with arts people and service people. So can you tell us a little bit about that and why you chose to do that? So what's, um, I think, probably a little bit of a shortfall in the way that we uh, do, well, okay, it is my opinion and other people will have other opinions, but it is my opinion that there is a bit of a shortfall in, the, in how we sort of spread attention so we put a lot of attention and focus on the heavy community. Um, the heavy community is what, 30% of the SCA population? I don't know, I'm pulling that out of my ass. It is not as large as say the arts and sciences and service. And yet we focus all of our sort of attention on guards toward the heavy light and, uh, sorry, the heavy, the archers and the um, non-armored combatants typically um, so we thought that we would we wanted to make sure that these guys weren't missing out that these guys still got the same amount of attention as what they had before but these guys were also getting attention so gabs had a guard of liverymen which were arts and sciences and service people and i looked i had a guard of um combatants of the you know various different flavors um, the other thing that we did was while gabs was out on the field playing around with the the fences and the heavy fighters um, <clears throat> was that I would invite people to talk about whatever project that they were working on. So that means at the event, they were also getting attention because what usually happens is that the queen has to sit there and respond to all the salutes and nobody else gets any attention except for the fighters again. So it was really important to us because we come from an everyone's equal in the salt mines comrade sort of oh, cat tail. Um, <laughs> Everyone's equal on the top my comrade sort of attitude toward um, the SCA that we're all equal in worth, that we needed to share the same amount of love with all those communities. Hmm. That's what that was about. And we did it both times and it was lots of fun and uh, not many other, I don't think anybody else has really carried on with that, but that's okay. That's who we are. So. Yeah. 
other people do other things. I think uh, with that, that you had that idea, how do you find with the more recent discussion of how to hold crowns, which is a quite a contentious one, I suppose, whether it's just the heavies fighting them rather than opening them up maybe to the arts and sciences or the rapier community, archery community. How, how do you feel about that? I struggle with the system that we have because it's inherently, it does have a bunch of systemic biases that no one has designed. They just exist. Um, and so until we end up with a situation where our crown is, you know, comes from more than one community, I think we're not, we're not going to be as, I don't know how you would do it though. That's where I get stuck. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, I don't like the way it's done. I enjoy the tournament. I think the tournament's fabulous. I think it's all wonderful and all the rest of it. Could it be shared? Maybe. Um, is it the right thing? I think it's, I think it's of its time. I think maybe we might want to start considering moving beyond that. How you would do it? Yeah. <laughs> I've got, I got nothing. Moose in the headlights. Um, so, yeah. And I look and I struggle because not only is it the heavy community that actually wield the decision on who ends up with the most power in the kingdom, right? It's most likely going to be a bloke. So, at the moment, so I'm, I'm struggling in lots of different sort of, yeah, I struggle a lot with that. It's part of the system that we've got, but it doesn't mean that the system has to always stay like that. I don't know what to do about it, though. I've received benefits from this system, so, but I can absolutely understand others who haven't, feeling a little bit about it as well so yeah it's it's a bit of a yeah i can see yeah it's contentious mm. and it's a very big thing to discuss uh, hmm. <laughs> that's a hard one sorry Eva. i know that you are a little bit of a, an introvert so <laughs> did you have any way how, how did you cope with being in on the throne because obviously being Baroness is a long-term haul and you're, you're always in the public eye. And then being queen means that you're, of course, you know, one of the two most viewed people in the kingdom for six months. So what did you do to, uh, to cope with that? And what self-care do you think that you, you did during that time to make sure that you didn't burn out or go crazy? <laughs> Oh, yeah, okay. There's lots of going crazy. The um, So, yes, I am introverted, but that doesn't mean that I can't stand up and speak in front of the cr in front of a crowd. I don't particularly like it, but I'll get up and do it because it's business um, and your job there is to perform. So that's just what you do. In terms of what was fabulous about um, our reigns, though, was that we had a fabulous guard um, that were fastidious in their duties in making sure that you know they watched our facial uh, movements because Gabs and I are both introverts and we don't tolerate people very well if they start doing anything stupid um, we will tell them um, which isn't particularly graceful I think you know you don't really want to cross oh, come on does that make sense so I think they were particularly attentive in making sure that we weren't in situations where we had to deal with, with people who were probably a little bit silly. Um, yeah. Did you have a saying or a sim single signal that you could uh, let them know? That is your guards. That is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't have a real, I, I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't have a poker face um they could see that like the little little things i get a little bit tense in my eyes and perhaps my lips get a little bit pursed and <laughs> maybe i can borrow my you don't need to give away your secrets in case you rain again but uh it's it's not happening again <laughs> we're, we're not. um <laughs> it's not happening um but yeah uh, I don't have anything really other than the self-care stuff probably making sure that um, we had space alone prior to going on into court, always had that 20, 30 minutes to prep alone. 
vital, absolutely yeah. vital. So you could just, you know, get as much energy, energy as you could before you went out and did a performance. So, yeah. What was and the most difficult time as Crown that you, or if you don't mind talking about it, that you experienced? Uh, I can't talk about that, actually. Uh, that's fair enough. My apologies. Yep. No, that's all right. I just can't. No, no. no. <laughs> Veggie might sandwich. The, um... <laughs> Did you, you've had a bit of time to think, did you have any proudest moments that you wanted to share? Um, mm, so, yeah, proudest moments of myself personally. I don't feel, I don't generally experience pride as a sensation. I feel satisfied. I don't necessarily feel pride. Um, I feel proud about other people's achievements, but not necessarily my own. Um, okay. I can rephrase this. Is there a moment you were particularly proud of Gabs when you were reigning? <laughs> uh, I'm hoping he yells out in the background. <laughs> no, he's probably listening. He's probably is probably. I'm very curious too. <laughs> Yes, he's quite curious too. I can't say, can't possibly say. There's so many, there's so many one one over the other, right? Right, that, that's it. I can't apparently, you know, bring one above any of the others. Yeah, sorry, I don't, do, I don't do fond memories or pride very well. Does that make sense? It's not something that I recall easily. <laughs> on the other hand, I can tell you exactly what happened because it's fun and silly and, and all the rest of it, but... Well, I suffered a moment in court. Pardon? Moment. Favorite moment in court. Favorite moment in court. It's ten years ago, man. I can't remember any of this. I'm too old for this. <laughs> it's it's now. Now. Uh, in the background yelling at me that your favorite moment had to be his nighting. So of course, yes, of course it was his nighting and when I told him quietly to clench his jaw before Gabs struck him. Um, <laughs> clench your jaw <laughs> while maintaining a smile so no one else could see or hear. Um, yeah, I think um, probably because everything is so controlled and I'm in such a panic when I'm in those sorts of things, I don't remember much. Um, I think um, one of the things I do remember is speaking for uh, Lucas... Uh, dash his um, knighting ceremony and um, being very grateful that Rothgar spoke before me because my god that man has projection and he put his hand on my shoulder and started projecting and I could feel his voice transform through my body out the other side because it was so loud I went right he's got his big boy voice on I've got to get my big girl voice on because it was a Rony festival so you have to really project so um, yeah that tiny little things like that are the things that I remember, but I don't remember that sort of stuff. Thank you. Ah. Can you tell us how, how many students do you currently have? And do you have any advice that you would give other peers on uh, maintaining those relationships Ooh. and guiding your students? Right. So I, <laughs> I leave, I, leave my students to go do their own thing and I basically only contact them when I know that things are going a little bit shit um so like they can contact me whenever they want to and how many students do I have I have Don Lucia I don't know I can't tell you I can't even remember two yeah I've got two that's how many I've got in my head Oh, yeah, 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 we both confirmed two students. I just got rid of one. Um, <laughs> um, I think way. in a good way, in a good way, not in a bad way. Um, Magnus has said 23. 23, well, that would be Gabs. That's how many students Gabs has. But, Gabs has got, um, but what I really like about the way that Gabs has his students is that he's, he contacts them every week via phone. Um, it's usually every week, every fortnight, and um, he's chatting to these guys that are not living in Brisbane, the guys that are out of town, um, and he chats to them every single week. And that's probably been, or every second week, which has been, Alex is going, puh, puh. 
which is more like a sort of like a sports coach, right? Trying to keep people motivated. That's probably one of the hardest things that we have in um, in either the sport or the service or the arts and sciences sphere is that whole sort of, you just basically need to touch base and keep people motivated. Um, and he does that particularly well. And if I was to take students on in the future, which I probably won't, um, it would probably absolutely um, be modelled against that sort of idea of coaching about what are we doing next, what you're doing, what's your barriers, those sorts of things. I, that, I imagine that would work differently for each student as well. Yeah. Some students would find that probably quite intimidating or annoying. Like they want to be left alone to do their own thing and, and can then come to you for advice. Well, he's got some students that, you know, might pop up every once in a while and say something, but he has got students that he is pretty regular. Yeah, that's right. So it is it is by student, but he does have a tendency to be regularly in contact as opposed to me, and I generally don't contact my students unless, you know. They need it. They need it, yeah. So we're coming close to the end of tonight's interview. And one of the traditions that the um, Roses have tended to ask is, what is your best story? No shit, there I was. <laughs> so Noreena asks whether or not I have, a, is that a favourite of Gabs's students or a favourite of my students? Because that changes at a whim, depending on whatever it is that they've done this particular minute. Um, so, yeah. It really, it does change a lot. So that's just to answer uh, Nissa's question. Do I have a favourite? Mm. <laughs> yeah, maybe Dimitri this week. Maybe, no. Well, according to Narina, it has to be one of the two you remember. Oh, well, the two that oh, of my students. Oh, well, I think it might have to be Domnal because... You know, it's Dom now in, uh, in, in Craig Glass or Stormhold. I'm not sure where he is. One of those two places down south. He lives He lives Stormhold. a Stormhold. Okay, radio. He lives away from here. <laughs> if it makes you feel better, by the way, about not remembering the amount of, of, of students that you have, I did one time complain in my house to a group of people like, nobody wants to be my apprentice. I had an apprentice for like a whole year before that. I just completely forgot about it. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. I understand. It's fine. Yeah, we, we're on the same page. You get it. <laughs> I do. It's like, I can't remember. Um, I'm crap though. So, yeah. So, Altani, you were about to ask me a question before I started answering. I love them all equally. Yes, apparently. Yes, and apparently I need them to fight for my love. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Could be an interesting um, scenario, that one. Well, it happens every sort of tournament, really. <laughs> what I'd actually ask is something that we ask all of our um, victims, not quite the right word, um, <laughs> is um, a no shit there I was story. A no shit there I was story. Mm. Oh, geez. Mm. Which one to choose, Gabs? Nothing from the peanut gallery. <laughs> in relation to you throwing up in the back of the tent? Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's great. That's a great story. It is, it is very different between his and my versions. Um, so we had, it was Rowney Festival. We were in our early 20s. So it's some time ago now. Um, <laughs> and we started, you know, drinking, we were drinking cider or maybe some red wine and, oh no, we started off with tequila shots. That's right. That's always a good way to start the night. So we started off with tequila shots. Um, and then we had some red wine and at some point Gabs and I had a disagreement. So I left. Evidently Gabriel then continued drinking with the, the crew and they'd finished, polished off the red wine and a friend of ours was insistent on continuing to drink. So 
uh, evidently somehow those bottles of red wine turned into bottles of cider. Like they went up to the bar and they filled them up with cider and came back and continued drinking. Not the smartest move, but Gabriel decided to take one for the team and started to drink all of the booze to stop her because she'd already had like six shots of tequila before the red wine. So he was jumping on that grenade. Anyway, so... Stuff happened. Stuff happened. What happened, Gabs? What happened, Gabs? See, I can't remember. I wasn't there for this bit. I only came at the end. You're gonna put your head. You're not gonna put your head across. Oh, oh, Good. On. Can they hear me? They can hear you. Okay. So, I realise I'm drunk and decide to go to bed. Okay. And I get in our small little two-person tent <laughs> because that's what it was in the '90s, and we were poor. And I did the zip up. And then I lay my head down and the world started spinning. And I'm like, oh no, oh no, oh, oh no, I've got to get out, I've got to get out. And I'm trying to undo the zip and I'm trying to undo the zip. Oh my God, I can't do it. And then I vomit in the back of the tent. At which point, at which point I realize I'm at the wrong end of the tent. And I'm like, oh no. And I grab the mattress out of the tent and start trying to clean it all up but fail miserably so eventually I fall asleep because I'm drunk and fall, we don't have a torch I can't find a torch and I fall asleep he's pulled the air mattress out and stuck it out in front of the bloody out. fire so I've come back into the encampment and I've shooed horses out of our encampment so this is the last time I've shooed, shooed horses out of our encampment to find Gabs asleep next to the fire I'm going what the hell is this? What's going on? Gabs? <laughs> what are you doing? You don't love me anymore. <laughs> what? You don't love me anymore. I've got, I don't know what you mean. What have you done? Like, I'm thinking maybe he's done... Ah, yes. Maybe he's, he's, you know, done something inappropriate. Maybe he's kissed another girl. Like, what's the worst thing that could... Like, what do you mean? You won't love me when you find out what I've done. And I'm, I've got no idea at this point. And, and I said, well, what did you do? He said, I threw up in the tent. And I said, righto. Honey, we need to move because it's starting to rain. <laughs> Hold me. <laughs> so I had to give him a hug and console him as he's crying. And it's starting to rain on my bed. And so we dragged the buttress into the kitchen and slept in there because we couldn't sleep in the vomit-induced tent. But, yeah, that's probably... That's our, like, you know, no shit there I was, his Rowney, first Rowney Festival uh, story where I had to um, <laughs> where I had to crowbar him into the car and then I had to crowbar him <laughs> to get home because, um, you know, he just spent the entire time just drinking and smoking the entire time. He had a great time throwing up in the back of the bloody tent. Anyway, good times. That was something that I did have to, I wanted to ask, because of course you were both playing very, very young. And I, I remember a conversation recently, but did you say that you used to go clubbing after heavy training? No, 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 I was after, so madrigals. We would sing madrigals, <laughs> and we'd go to a coffee shop, drink coffee, and then go off to a nightclub. Goth so the, club. goth club, goth club, every Friday night. <laughs> That's what you did. That makes so much more sense because in my mind, when you said it was training, I thought it was heavy training. I went, Gabs would fight and then get into goth attire, and which I imagine is warm in Brisbane. Oh yeah, that's right, Gabs. Yeah, that's right. In Brisbane, Brisbane goths. They were a thing. They were a thing, and I don't know. Well, I, I have a really odd sort of. There's a smell of hairspray. It has special memories. Um, yeah, yeah, well, but, but, absolutely, isn't but, probably. He'd probably wear his armour into the bloody goth club. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Good times. Good times. Now, we have had you uh, captive for an hour. And uh, before we say goodbye, we is, we'd just like to know, is there anything that you haven't touched on that you'd like to talk about or say? If you want a grandstand, now's your time. Mm, no. 
can't think of anything that I would want to grandstand about other than everybody should be, you know, wearing Spanish. <laughs> if I could have everybody wearing Spanish at an event at the same period, like like that sort of 1500 to 1550, I'd be happy as a clam. But it is not to be. I have to go to Spain to get that sort of treatment. <laughs> well, I'm sure once we come back to more and more face to face, they're going to see your magnificent headgear, and there's going to be ladies lined up at your door. Yeah, that's right. Saying I need to wear this on my head. See, everybody, everybody needs to get one of these. Oh yeah, <laughs> and more heraldry. Damn it! Yes. Hell, get your get your gear on banner. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Your Grace. You have been amazing as usual. Um, say that to all the girls. <laughs> and thank you, Duchess Altani, for joining me as well. Uh, I am not sure what we have coming through the pipeline, but you know, this has been Crown Between Two Roses and keep an eye on our page and follow us if you'd like to see our events in future. So. Thank you again for joining us and uh, we'd like to wish everyone a pleasant evening. Keep safe everyone. Thank you Stanzi. Thank you Eva. See everyone. Adios.